السلام علیکم میرا نام جیریمی ہے میں آسٹریلین ہوں مگر آٹھ سال سے پاکستان میں رہ رہا ہوں شاید آپ سوچ رہے ہیں کہ یہ بندہ کون ہے کیا پاگل ہے But um, I, I came to Pakistan on a whim um, about eight years ago. I was meant to be here on a two-month traineeship where I'd be implementing social impact projects with university students. And what struck me when I came to Pakistan at that time was just like the sheer amount of opportunities and the talent that's here in this country. And so I canceled my plans back in Australia, and I ended up working for that organization, ISEC, for another year and a half. And, uh, you know, all, there were plenty of opportunities during those eight years for me to leave. And I think Pakistan gave me a lot of reasons. We've been through some very difficult times. But there was always something that drew me back. And I, I'd like to think in retrospect that it was a higher calling. Um, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about that today. So, five years ago, I was living in Karachi and witnessing for the first time what is it like to live in a city where the basic infrastructure and services are not available. No water, electricity, sanitation, transport. And growing up in Australia, I had all of these things and, and you know, I took them for granted. But living in Karachi, where the power would go every, every two hours, um, it was really striking to me, particularly like how important electricity is to, to productivity and to people's lives. Take, for example, if you're unlucky enough to reach a photocopier, at a time when there's load shedding, the, the guy's going to say to you, He's going to say, you know, there's no electricity, come back after an hour. And what struck me about not only this example, but on a larger level, is how is the country supposed to run, let alone move forward, if after every other hour, everything shuts down? And then I thought to myself, well, if it's this bad in the economic hub, how much worse is it going to be in a rural area? Luckily, a friend of mine had been doing some research in a village that was unelectrified, or what we would call off-grid. And so one weekend, a bunch of us hopped in a car. We drove 10 hours. This map says 7 hours 43, but uh, Google Maps is wrong. It's 10 hours. And um, you know, we went to this town of, of Nagar Parker to really see like, what is it like um, in an off-grid village. And as we were leaving Karachi, we saw the we saw the scenery change. It got more and more like a desert. There was less and less vegetation, and it became more and more desolate. And then when we reached the village, it was as if we had stepped back in time. There was no electricity whatsoever. And like, for me, it, it struck me like just how different these villages are and how we don't get to see them. Living in a city, living in Islamabad, Karachi, Lahore, we don't see what it's like, and it's not under our noses. And what really struck me about this was that all life, all economic and social activity just comes to a halt and people go to sleep. So after that weekend, I thought to myself, well, I would like to do something about this. I you know, want to research this more. I want to find out what, what can be done. And so that set me down a path that I think that consumed me for the past five years. And along the way, I, let, I met my co-founder, Shazia, and we discovered that we had a shared passion for this and that we wanted to do more that we wanted to invest our time and money um, to make something of it. And so we continued to do research across villages in Sindh and, and try and get a better understanding of what is it going to take to bring electricity to these people. We raised a bit of money, and in 2013, we hired a team that was actually going to go out there into the villages on a daily basis and build that understanding. In the past two and a half years, they've mapped energy access across 2,000 villages in about two, three, four districts. And the red dots on this uh, is a village that has no electricity whatsoever. That's like, no grid connection. The yellow ones have maybe a little bit of electricity. But this is a huge problem and, and that, it, that it needs to be solved. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we've gone on to solve that and I think how everyone else can get involved uh, with that. But I'd like to, talk, to give you an example that I think tells you or like, illustrates the pain that's involved in not having electricity in your home. So, this is Pavel. He lives in the district of Sin, um, sorry, in the district of Bedin, in the province of Sin. He doesn't have electricity in his home. So every day he works, wakes up at 6 a.m., he goes out into the field and he, he looks at his crops, he makes sure, that, makes sure that everything's okay. And on one particular morning, he looks at his cell phone and he realizes that it's out of battery. 
And then he realizes that his son was playing with his phone last night. And in the process, he must have uh, run out of battery and his son didn't tell him. Now, under normal circumstances, that would not be a problem. You know, you go to the wall socket, you plug it in, and, and everything would be fine. The problem here is that Pavo doesn't have electricity. And uh, one of his relatives is coming from Karachi with some money, and um, he needs that money to pay for bills, he needs to pay for groceries, things like that. And if he doesn't have his phone, he can't contact that relative. So he puts his work aside, he goes to the nearest road, and he waits for a ride to come along that's going to take him to the nearest electrified town, some 20 kilometers away. About an hour later, he gets there, he gives his phone over to one of the, the shopkeepers, uh, and 10 rupees, the guy charges the phone, and for the next couple of hours, Pavel has to go wait uh, while that phone is charged. Eventually, he, you know, he gets the money, he meets his relative, everything's peachy. But by the time he gets home, it's sunset, and he has enough time to have dinner with his family, and then everyone goes to sleep. But in the couple of moments before, you know, before he actually falls asleep, he thinks to himself that I've wasted an entire day. Uh, there was so much more that I could have done, but because of this mistake, I lost it. And the sad part of this is that so much productivity is lost uh, just because people don't have power lines coming to their home. I think what's even sadder is that this is just one story out of approximately 70 million across this country people that don't have electricity in, in their homes. And what this means is that every day, they're not leading productive lives. You have kids that aren't able to study at night. You have mosquito nets that are lit on fire by tipped over kerosene lamps. And you have snake bites in the middle of the night because people can't see that there's a snake on the ground. And this is holding back. I mean, unfortunately, we don't see these people and, and, and it's not under our noses, but you know, this is happening every single day. And so these people, instead, are, you, are spending $1.2 billion a year on poor quality alternatives like kerosene lamps, battery-powered torches and candles, spending a lot of money for a solution that's just not going to provide them enough light, which they can't read by, and they definitely can't charge mobile phones. And something needs to be done about this. For us, living in a, living in a city, we benefit from electricity. The problem is that our emissions from this electricity are really, really high. You know, 64% of our electricity comes from furnace oil and gas, and that's destroying the environment. In the meantime, the world is moving towards a clean energy future. We have the US, which is committed to 8 gigawatts of installed solar capacity by the end of this year. We have India that's committed to 10 gigawatts next year, and they've already gotten a head start because they've converted an entire airport to use solar. Pakistan, on the other hand, isn't. We're pulling coal out of the ground to power 1.4 gigawatts worth of coal power plants. We're heading in the opposite direction. And we do have some glimmers of hope like the um, Gaidi Azam solar park, but it's not enough. That, that's 100 megawatts at the moment compared to 1.4 gigawatts of, of coal. Now, don't get me wrong. Electricity is great. I love it. Um, I think like we lead more as, as a result of this access to electricity. It powers our projectors. It powers our lights. ACs, iPhones, and we've been able to make technolog technological advances because of this. But at the same time, I think, as we all know, we need to be transitioning to a clean energy economy so that we're not destroying the environment in the process. But at the same time, we need to be providing these opportunities to the people that don't have electricity in parallel. We need to address their, human, their basic human rights, and we need to give them an opportunity to have economic prosperity. Now, the problem with this is that if we were to bring all of these people onto the grid or give them electricity overnight, our, you know, we would be accelerating climate change because all of the, our greenhouse gas emissions would increase. And to anyone who thinks this, I would ask, do we need to repeat the same mistakes over and over again, or is there something that we can learn from this? So, I would like you to, to picture this, that where we have an entire generation who is experiencing electricity for the first time. They're getting access to it in their home for the first time. And the only type of electricity that they know comes from a renewable, clean energy source, that's solar. And you know, th th the impact that this could make on these people's lives is fantastic. And so I'm proud to say that this revolution has already started. Right? 
it, it, it's beginning, it's begun in East Africa, and there's a huge amount of, uh, there's actually millions of people in the past decade that have gotten access to electricity that's clean uh, in, in the past 10 years, predominantly in East Africa. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about how, you know, how that's happened. It typically starts with a solar lantern, which can give four to six hours of light. It's then, once the people have saved up a little bit of money, they'll get a, a solar system which can power a couple of lights and a mobile charger, very important. Then they'll buy a fan, a TV, a fridge, and maybe one day they'll, ch they'll convert their diesel water pump into one that's powered by solar. And the reason why this has happened in, in East Africa is due to a couple of reasons. There's, uh, I think, uh, millions of people in the past five years that have gotten access. And it's because there's been a global fall in solar prices. There have been people who have been dedicated to producing high quality and affordable solar products. And we've had entrepreneurs who have dedicated their time and money to figure out how to get it from a factory into the hand of so hands of someone who doesn't have electricity and is far, so far that the government can't provide services to them. Now, that's a tough ask. To give you an example of this, we piloted a product last year in, uh, in Patan to Javel that uh, can provide up to 20 hours of light on a single day's charge and has inbuilt technology where if the customer fails to make a payment on time, they'll automatically shut off. And all of this is available on monthly installments, which add up to 1,500 rupees. So this technology, commonly called pay as you go, has been like, spreading across like, the, de the developing world um, like wildfire, and it's actually had a huge impact in, in East Africa. One of these impacts has been with a, a company called Mkopa, which has provided 250,000 households in the past three years with modern electricity, lights, fans, mobile, and a mobile charger. And I think this is incredible. What it's also allowed is that unlocked financing from banks. You know, these commercial banks are typically very risk averse. But they've had so much faith in this, and they've seen the data that's come back, they said, we're willing to finance this. In East Africa, they've also benefited from help from the government. There are some very progressive policies. The Tanzanian government committed to light up one million homes on solar by 2017. They only let high quality products through customs, and there's a general ease of doing business for both local and international companies. But what about Pakistan? Well, this is what we're here to talk about. I see a lot of missed opportunities. There was an announcement the other week of a US-Pakistan clean energy partnership. And it celebrated the fact that they're planning to install three gigawatts of, of capacity to the grid, which is going to impact 30 million people. Now, that's great. For all of us, that's great, because we'll have less load shedding. But I thought at that time, what about the 70 million people who've never had access to this? Why is, why is no one talking about them? And why is it not a government priority? But despite the doom and gloom, I would say there is a lot of hope here. We have a handful of companies who are actually working towards this and have been working hard over the past couple of years in Pakistan. We have the I IFC Lighting Pakistan team who have recently launched a massive consumer awareness campaign across the country, and it's only going to ramp up. We have product manufacturers that are now bringing their products into the country. We have microfinance banks, and we have last mile distribution companies like the one that I co-founded, that are working on how to get it from these manufacturers into the hands of, of customers. And all of us have seen, like what, is, like, what are the changes that these products make in the lives of people? Here's an example, Samina Lashari from Kaka. She used a solar lantern to study for a couple of hours every night, and what she was able to do was to be the first girl in her village to, to graduate from secondary school. And she then went on to university. Without this light, she wouldn't, have been she wouldn't have been able to study at night, and that would have been a real shame because she has so much potential. This is Opayo Kaskeli, also from Kaka. He used to use a diesel generator to power, t power a TV in his haba, or tea stall, and uh, the reason why he did that was it would, it would attract customers. The problem was that that generator would break down every couple of days, and he'd have to spend 200 rupees a day in diesel to power it. Instead, he now has a solar-powered TV, which comes with a warranty and customer service. It costs him less per month. And because of the greater reliability, he has more customers. He's making more money, and that means more money for his family. There's also been a trickle-down effect in the, in the local economy. We've met rickshaw wallers 
who are getting more business and, and more passengers because people want to go to these dhabas to watch TV, you know, to see the news, to see what's going on in the rest of the world. So it impacts the local economy. And then we have Pavel. Imagine how much different, how different his life would have been had he, if he had light and a mobile charger in the home. On that particular day, which I'm sure happens at least once or twice a week, he would have been able to work instead of wasting his entire day traveling to get his mobile charge. And that would mean more, mo more money for his family. Maybe his children could attend school. And maybe his wife would be able to get the medicine that, sh that she needs. And, and that would have a, pro have a profound impact not only on him, but on future generations. So these are the stories for me that really like, motivate me. And, and, and when I talk to my peers about this, these are the stories that motivate them. They're all very, very passionate about bringing this change to a massive population that is underserved. Now, we need more. Like, it, it's just a handful of people at the moment. We need an ecosystem. This ecosystem needs risk capital to promote startups. It needs distribution companies that are stocking these solutions at every single roadside shop. I should be able to walk a couple of hundred meters into a town and be able to grab one of these products. We need service centers where people can, res can repair and, and service these products. And we need banks to come in and fund the consumer finance. I know that we have the talent. This is the reason why I initially stayed in Barca. You know, there are entrepreneurial people, there are established companies that can really drive innovation uh, in, in this area. What's going to help us is the government coming in and acting as a catalyst and really accelerating the rate of change. So here's what I propose. We have a government campaign to provide one million households with solar by 2017. The government makes a conducive environment, they remove red tape, they de-risk investment into this area, and then let the private sector sell, finance, and service these solutions for the one million people. What we'll do in the process is demonstrate that off-grid electrification is possible without accelerating climate change, and we'll have economic growth, because you'll suddenly have one million people that have extra productive hours in the day, sorry, one million households over six million people that have extra productive hours in the day. These, that's going to mean that kids are going to study, they're going to, there's going to be less respiratory illnesses, and people are going to run, run more businesses and earn more money and have more money that they can save for the future. So, given that you're here, I assume you're all very interested in addressing climate change, and I would implore you to, that if this is something that moves you, if this is something that you want to get behind, then get involved. Go out there and start a business. Start an NGO, do something about this. You can talk to your local MPA or your MA, and if you have access, go and meet the Prime Minister and tell him that this is something that's important and it's not getting enough attention. And maybe if we're all working on this together, we can establish Pakistan as a leader of a global solar revolution.